Boxing Hall of Fame. All right. All right.
to say, prayer works. Tennessee, a 
addressing the issues the sanitation workers are having down in Memphis, Tennessee, the Mason Temple. He's calling the prophet. He's calling for us to stick together, you know, in unity. But like I said, we're not broke. We just got to, you know, come together. I want to thank you very kindly, my friends. As I listen to Ralph Abernathy and his eloquent and general century Duxy, I then thought about myself. It's always good to have your closest friend and associate say something good about you. And Ralph Abernathy is the best friend I've had in this whole world. I'm delighted to see each and every one of you here tonight. In spite of the storm warning, you revealed that you're determined to go on anyhow. Something is happening in Memphis. Something is happening in our world. And as you know, if I was standing at the beginning of the time, with the general and the panoramic view of the whole human history up until now, and the Almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, which age would you want to live in? I would take my mental flight by Egypt, through and across the Red Sea, through the wilderness, on toward the promised land. And in spite of its magnificence, I wouldn't stop there. I would move on toward Greece, and I would take my mind to Mount Olympus, and I would see Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Euripides, Aristophanes, and some around the Parthenon as they discuss the great eternal issues of reality. But I wouldn't stop there. I would go up to the great head near the Roman Empire, and I would see developments around there through various emperors and leaders. But I wouldn't stop there. I would even go by the way of the man from whom my name had his habitat. And I would watch Martin Luther as he tacked his 95 Thesis on the door of the church at Wittenberg. But I wouldn't stop there. I would come up to 1863 and I would watch a vacillating president by the name of Abraham Lincoln finally come up with the conclusion that he had to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. But I wouldn't stop there. Strangely enough, I would turn to the Almighty and I would say if you allow me to live just a few years into the second half of the 20th century, I would be happy. And that's a strange statement to make because the world is all messed up. The nation is sick, troubled in the land, confusion all around. That's a strange statement to make. But I know that somehow, that only when it's dark enough can you see the stars. And I see God moving in this period of the 20th century in a way that men in some strange way are responding. Something's happening in our world. And the mass of people are rising up. And wherever they are, some of that today, whether it's Johannesburg, South Africa, mm. Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, New York City, Jackson, Mississippi, Memphis, Tennessee, the crowd's always the same. We want to be free. Now, another reason why I'm happy to live in this period is that we have been forced to a point to grapple with the problems that men have been trying to grapple with through history. But the demands did not force them to do it. Survival demands that we grapple with them. Men for years now have been talking about war and peace, but no longer can we just talk about it. It's not a choice between violence and non-violence in this world. It's non-violence or non-existence. Mm. And that's where we are today. Yes, and also in the human rights revolution. If something isn't done, and done in a hurry to bring out colored people out of their long years of poverty, out of their long years of hurt and neglect, the whole world is doomed. Mm. Now I'm just happy that God has allowed me to live in this period to see what's unfolding. I'm glad God has allowed me to be here in Memphis. I can remember, I can remember as Ralph Abernathy has said, when niggas was going around scratching when they did our this and laughing when they were not tipping. Well, that day is all over now. We mean business. And we're determined to gain our rightful place in God's world. And that's all this whole thing is about. We are not in, you know, engaged in any negative protests or any negative arguments with anyone. We're just saying we're determined to be free. We want to be determined to be men. We're saying we're God's children. We just want to be treated the way we want to be treated. Now what does all this mean in this great period of history? It means that we got to stay together. We got to stay together and maintain unity. You know, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, he had a favorite, favorite form for doing it. What was that? He kept the slaves fighting amongst each other. But whenever the slaves got together, something happens in Pharaoh's court. The slaves didn't hold the slavery no longer. When the slaves got together, that was getting, I'm getting out of slavery. Now let us maintain unity. 
Secondly, we got to keep the issues where they are. The issue is injustice. Mm -hmm. The issue is refusal of methods to be fair and honest in this dealing with this public <coughs> servants who have to be sanitation workers. Now we got to keep attention on that. You see, there's always the problem with a little violence. You know what happened the other day? And the press dealt only with the window breaking. You see, I read the article. Verse 7 got around to mention the fact that there are 1,300 of God's children here on strike. And then it ended up being fair to them. That's the issue. So we got to say to the nation that we know what the issue is. Oh, man, what's your name? 1,300 of God's children here on strike. Hold on, man. <laughs> You know what happened the other day? And the press dealt only with the window breaking. You see, I read the article. Verse 7 got around to mention the fact that there are 1,300 sanitation workers on strike, and that Memphis is not being fair to them. That man Lowe's and died either, but died. They didn't get around to that. So we got to march again. We're going to march again in order to put the issues where they're supposed to be and force everyone to see that there are 1,300 guards sitting here on strike. <clears throat> here going hungry. Going through dark and dreary nights, wondering where this thing gonna come out. That's the issue. So we gotta say to the nation, we know how it's coming out. For when people get caught up with that which is right and willing to sacrifice for it, there's no stopping point short of victory. We're not letting any mate stop us. You see, we're masses in a nonviolent movement and disarm the police forces. They don't know what to do. I've seen them so often. I remember Birmingham, Alabama. We were in that domestic struggle there. We'll move out of 16th Street Baptist Church day by day, by the hundreds. We'll move out. And Bull Connor will say, send the dogs forth. And they did come. We just went on before the dogs seen. Ain't gonna let nobody turn us back. Bull Connor next will say, turn the fire hose on. But like I said the other night, Bull Connor didn't know history. He know kind of physics that somehow did not relate to the trans physics that we know about. And that was the fact that there was a certain kind of fire no water could put up. So we went on before the fire holes. We had no water. If we were Baptists or any other denomination, we would have been immersed. If we were Methodists or any other, we would have been spread, but we knew water. That couldn't stop us. So we went on before the police dogs and we looked at them. We went before the fire holes and we looked at it and we just went on singing. Over my head, I see freedom in the air. They would be thrown into the paddy wagons. Sometimes we would stack them there like sardines in a can. They would throw us in, and old Bull Connor would say, take them off. And they did. We just went off in the paddy wagon scene. We shall overcome. And every now and then we'd get down to the jail, and we'd see the jail looking through the windows, we'd get moved by words, then moved by prayers and our songs. And there was a power there that Bull Connor couldn't adjust to. So we ended up transforming the boy into a steer. And we won our struggle in Birmingham. Now we got to go on the message just like that. And I call upon you to be with us when we go out Monday. Not about injunctions. We're going to court tomorrow morning to fight this illegal, unconstitutional injunction. All we say to America is be true to what you say on paper. Now I live in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country. Maybe I can understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I can understand some of these basic First Amendment privileges because they hadn't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatest of America is the right to protest for right. So just as I said, we're not letting any police dogs or water holders turn us around. We're not letting any injunction turn us around. We're going on. And we need all of them. And you know what's beautiful to me? to see all these ministers of the gospel. It's a marvelous picture. Who is it that is supposed to articulate the longings and aspirations of the people more than the preacher? Somehow the preacher got to have a kind of fire shut up in his bones, and whenever injustice is around, he tell it. Yes. Somehow the preacher got to say the things. When God speaks, who can but prophesy? Yes. Again, like angels, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. So my other preacher got to say to Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me. He has anointed me to deal with the problems of the poor. And I want to commend the preacher on the leadership of these noble men, James Lawson, 
One of them been in the struggle for many years. He's been in jail for a struggle. He's been kicked out of Vanderbilt University for a struggle, but he's still going on, fighting for the rights of his people. Reverend Ralph Jackson, Billy Cow. I can just go right on down the list of time will not permit, but I want to thank them. I want you to thank them as well because so often people aren't concerned about anyone but themselves. And I'm always happy to see a relevant ministry. It's all right to talk about long white roads over yonder and all the symbolism. But ultimately, people see some suits, some dresses, some shoes way down here. It's all right to talk about the street flowing with milk and honey. But God commanded us to be concerned about the slums down here and his children who can't eat three square meals a day. It's all right to talk about the new Jerusalem. But one day, God preached to talk about the new New York, the new Atlanta, yeah. the new Chicago, yeah, the new Philadelphia, the new Los Angeles, and the new Memphis, Tennessee. Now, this is what we got to do. Another thing we got to do is this. We got to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. Now, we poor people. Individually, we poor when you compare us to white society in America, but never stop and forget that collectively. That means all of us together. Collectively, we're richer than all the nations of the world, with the exception of nine. After the United States, Soviet Russia, West Germany, Great Britain, France. And I can name the others, but the American Negro is richer than most of the nations in the world. We have an annual income of more than $30 billion a year, which is more than all the exports of the United States, and it's more than the national budget of Canada. And you know that. That's power there that we know how to pool it. So we don't got to go around and argue with anyone. We ain't got to go around cursing or acting bad with our words. We don't need any bricks and bottles. We don't need any Molotov cocktails. We just need to go around to these stores and to these massive industries and say, God sent us by here to say to you that you have not been treating these children right. And we came out here to ask you to make the first item on your agenda fair treatment when God's children are concerned. And if you're not prepared to do that, we have an agenda that we must follow. And our agenda calls for withdrawing economic support from you. And as a result of that, we ask you to go out and tell your neighbor not to buy Coca-Cola Memphis. Go buy and tell them not to buy sealed test milk. Go buy and tell them not to buy, what is that other bread coming, Jesse? Wonder bread. Go buy and tell them not to buy hot bread. And as Jesse Jackson has said up until now, only the garbage men have been feeling the pain. Now we got to kind of like redistribute the pain. We choose these companies because they have not been fed in their hiring policies, and we choose them because they can support the needs and the rights of these men who are on strike. Then we can move on downtown and tell Matt Lowe to do what's right. But not only that, we got to strengthen black institutions. I call upon you to go take your money out of the banks downtown. Go deposit your money in Tri State Bank. We want a banking in the methods. Go by the Save the Loan Association. And we're not telling you something we don't do here at SCLC. Judge Hooks and others will tell you that we have an account here from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and follow what we do. Put your money there. And also you got six or seven black insurance companies here in the city of Memphis. Take out your insurance there. We want insurance in. Now these are some practical things that we can do. We begin the process of building a greater economic base and at the same time we put pressure where it really hurts. I ask that you follow through here. Now let me say as I move to my conclusion that we got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. Nothing will be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. We got to see it through. And when we march, you need to be there. If it means leaving work, be there. If it means leaving school, be there. Be concerned about your brother. You may not be on strike, but either we go up together or we go down together. Let us develop a kind of like dangerous unselfishness. One day a man came to Jesus, wanted to raise some questions about some vital matters in life. And at points he wanted to trick Jesus as if he knew a bit more than Jesus knew. <laughs> now the question could easily end up in a philosophical or theological debate. But Jesus immediately pulled the question from there there and placed it on a dangerous curve between Jerusalem and Jericho when he spoke to a certain man who fell among thieves. You remember when the priest and the Levite passed by on the side of they did not stop to help him. And finally, a man of another race came by, got down from his beast, and decided not to be compassionate by proxy. But he got down with him, administered first aid, and, and helped the man in need. Now, Jesus ended up saying this was a good man. This was a great man because he had the capacity to protect the iron to the valve and be concerned.
concerned about his brother. Now we use our imagination a great deal to try to determine why the priest and the Levite did not stop. At times we say they were busy going to a church meeting, an ecclesiastical gathering, and they had to get down to Jerusalem so they would not be late for their meeting. At other times we speculate that there was religious law, and one who had engaged in religious ceremony was not to touch a human body 24 hours before the ceremony. And every now and then we begin to weather, weather, whether or not they're going down to Jericho or down to Jerusalem, rather to, to organize the Jericho Road Improvement Association. That's a possibility. Maybe they thought it was better to deal with the problem from the capital route rather than get bogged down with an individual effect. Well, I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me. Maybe those men were afraid. You see, the Jericho Road, that's a dangerous road. I can remember when Mrs. King and I first went to Jerusalem. We rented a car, and as soon as we got on the road, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus uses that as a setting for his parable. It's a winding, meandering road that's really conducive for ambushing. So you start out in Jerusalem, which is 1,200 miles, around 1,200 feet above sea level. And by the time you're down to Jericho, 15 to 20 minutes later, you're 2,200 feet below sea level. That's a dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the bloody path. And it's possible that the Levite and the priest looked over that man on the ground and, and wondered if the robbers were still around. Or it's possible they thought the man on the ground was really faking, acting like he had been robbed and hurt in order to lure the men for quick and easy season. So the first question that the priest asked, and the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what's going to happen to me? But the good Samaritan came by and reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what's going to happen to him? That's the question for you tonight. Now if I stop to help the sanitation worker, what's going to happen to my job? Now if I stop to help the sanitation worker, what's going to happen to all the hours I used to spend in the office every day and every evening as a pastor? Now if I stop to help the sanitation worker, what's going to happen to me? The question before you tonight is if I do not stop to help the sanitation worker, what's going to happen to them? That's the question. Let us rise up tonight with the greater readiness. Let us stand with the greater determination. Let us move on these powerful days. These days are challenged to make a miracle what it ought to be. We have an opportunity to make a miracle a great nation. And I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book I had written. And while sitting there autographing books, a demented black woman came up. And the only question I heard from her was, are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down right, and I said, yes. The next minute, I felt something beating on my chest. Before I had known that I had been stabbed by this demented woman, I rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon, and that blade had gone through, and the x-ray revealed that the tip of the blade was at the edge of my egg or the main artery. And once that's punctured, you drown in your own blood, that's the end of you. Well, it came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, after the operation, after my chest had been opened, after the blade had been taken out, they allowed me to move around in the wheelchair in the hospital. And they allowed me to read some of the mail that they came in, and, and kind letters came in from all over the states in the world. And I read a few. But there's one I'll never forget. I received a letter from the president and the vice president, but I forgot what those letters had said. I received a telegram from the governor of New York but I forgot what those letters had said. But there was another letter, a letter from a little girl, a young girl who was a student at the White Plains High School. And I looked over that letter, and I'll never forget it. It simply said, Dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. And she said, not that it should matter, but I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. And I read of your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you had a sneeze, you would have died. Well, I'm simply writing you to say, I'm so happy you didn't sneeze. And I want to say tonight, and I want to say tonight that I too am happy I didn't sneeze. Because if I had a sneeze, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in their lunch counters. And I knew as they were sitting there, they were standing up for the best of the American dream, bringing that whole nation back to those great worlds of democracy, which were dug deep by the founding fathers of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1961 
when we decided to take a ride for freedom to end segregation and interstate travel. Mm -hmm. Rattlesnakes. I went a bit here in 1962 when Negroes in Albany, Georgia decided to straighten their backs up. Because whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they're going somewhere. Because the man can't ride your back unless it's bent. Oh. Bad sleeves. I went a bit around here in 1963 when black people of Birmingham, Alabama aroused the council of the nation yes, and brought in the bend and civil rights bill. Yes, sir. Bad sleeves. I wouldn't have had a chance later that year in August to tell you about a dream I had had. If I had a sneeze, I wouldn't have been down in South Alabama to see the great movement there. If I had a sneeze, I wouldn't have been down in Memphis, Tennessee to see the community rallying over those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy I didn't sneeze. And they were telling me. And they were telling me. Now it doesn't matter now. It really doesn't matter what happens now. We left Atlanta this morning, and as we got started for the plane, there were six of us. And the pilot said over the public address system, we're sorry for the delay, but we have Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane. And to be sure all the bags were checked, and to be sure nothing will be wrong with on the plane, we had the plane protected and guarded all night. Then we got to Memphis. And some began to say the threats. I talk about the threats that were out, about what would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers. Well, I don't know what's going to happen now. We got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter to me now, because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind, like anybody. I like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. He's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I might not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as people will get to the promised land. I'm so happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord.
absolutely brilliant. Let me just add to what he was doing. If you would turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 37, Genesis chapter 37. I'm going to talk for just a little while. Very short time. Genesis chapter 37, commencing at verse 23. Dream. 
it, it means as a person that sleep. But it means more than that. The most significant use that we have in the Bible uh, is this word dream. However, it is reference to the prophetic dream or the prophetic vision that God gives to his prophets. Yeah, Moses writes in Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 1, he says, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sound of wonder, uh, this is writing that, that God gives his revelation to his prophets and he sometimes gives them the dreams through, gives them the revelation through their dreams. We understand that, that Joseph had a dream. And so if you look in verse 5, Joseph did something in his dream. It says, and Joseph dreamed a dream. And he told it his brethren. And they did what? They hated him yet the more. Joseph told his dream. And so, uh, in light of all of that, uh, it was, was whatever your dream is that God has given to you, we need to understand that before that you realize the dream and the dream actually comes true, you got to go through some pits in life. You got to go through some pits in life. And, 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 and there's no sense in saying that I'm going to live my life without some trials and tribulations because that's just not true. Uh, you've got to go through some pits. And not only do you have to go through some pits of life, listen, you've got to go through some prisons within your life. You've got to go through some prisons before you get to the palace of your life. So then, as we see here with uh, Joseph, and I really don't have a lot of time to unpack every word that's here, and so we'll do we'll do a part one today, and we'll go do a part two some other time. But in the life of Joseph, uh, we see God's divine hand, God's divine protection for him. We see God working in the life of Joseph. Um, it is not happenstance, though, that Joseph appeared in this pit. You see, interesting enough, Joseph exposed his dream early in his life that caused his brothers to be jealous and to rule over him and to cast him down into this pit. Looking at the life of Joseph reminds us and teaches us that elevation to prominence, to whatever prominence position that God gives you, does not come without a sacrifice. And we hold now the present age what others sacrifice in years past. In other words, for us to vote today, for us to attend the schools of our choices, for us to walk down the sidewalks, yes. for us to enjoy the freedom yes. and to be able to buy yes. what you want to, some people had to die. Yes. And some people had to sacrifice yes. for what we're now doing yes. right today. Yes. So then we've got to appreciate yes. our forefathers for what yes. they went through. Yes. And we ought to be ashamed yes. if we don't go to the polls and vote because people gave their lives. that's in this nation that have not been through as much as we have been through for 400 years through slavery. Imagine, imagine what that does to a generation of people in slavery for 400 years. This country was built on the back of a culture and that culture was in this building right here, right now. Amen. So then you look at the city of New Orleans. New Orleans, now, when you go to New Orleans, you don't say New Orleans. You just put it all off and just say New Orleans. But today, I'm just going to say New Orleans 
because I'm not from New Orleans, but that city was built by slaves. The great city of New York built by slaves. Some of the other great cities that we have in this nation built by slaves, but yet we're on the bottom end of the economic trends across the nation. So it's time now for us to rise up, to stand up, and to be up on what the Lord has desired for us to have. So then, Bible, Psalms 37 simply says that if you would delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. So this takes my mind back to Joseph. Joseph had a mind for the God. Yes, sir. Yes. He had a mind for God, and, and God always had his hand mm -hmm. on Joseph. Yes. As Joseph looked and went to went to find his brothers, his brothers threw him down in the pit. Uh -huh. um, but but that's okay. Being down in a pit, uh -huh. um, thank God that it wasn't worse than what it could have been. <laughs> But the pit was empty. But not only did he find himself, and I'm and I'm just going over a lot of stuff here because I've got to get to the end. Um, that um, he moves from the pit, and they sell him. And, and let me just do just a little bit of teaching here. It says right in the text, it gives two culture of people. It, it gives the Midianites and it gives the Ishmaelites. So they sold Joseph to uh, the Ishmaelites, but this was a caravan. This was a, and, and, and in that day, in a caravan, you had multiple cultures in one caravan. You see, sort of like the caravan that's down in Mexico that's headed this way, supposedly. Now, we, now, this caravan has been moving for a long time, and we haven't seen this caravan yet. Uh, so, in this particular caravan that's mentioned in verse 28, you had a bunch of people. And so, you may become confused. Who did Joseph's brothers sell him to? Did they sell him to the Ishmaelites, or did they sell him to the Midianites? Well, they sold him to the Ishmaelites, but in that particular caravan, well, other cultures like the Midianites, and it was in the environment, it says that the pit was in the wilderness. And that wilderness was in Midian. And you would have Midianites in that particular area. So then we see Joseph was sold. He was sold into slavery. And there within slavery, Joseph goes and they sell him to Potiphar. But guess what? Joseph now ends up in prison because Potiphar's wife yep. saw him and saw that he was a good-looking man, yeah. and, and, and she tried to uh, seduce him. Yeah. But Joseph knew. Yeah. He ran out of some stuff. And you see, that's a lesson right there. We got to learn to run out of some stuff. He ran out of the coat uh, that was on him, and he left that in her hands, but she lied on him. Yes. And as she lied on him, Potiphar came back and threw him in the jail. Yeah. Yeah. Down in the jail, mm -hmm. Joseph, he met a butler. Yeah. And then he met a baker. Yeah. And meeting the butler, he told the butler to don't forget him. Uh -huh. So the butler had a dream. Yeah. And he had this dream about uh, three, three branches. And, yeah. and, and what was on the three, the fruit that was on the branches. And uh, Joseph interpreted his dream and told him that those three branches are, you know, are, are have wine on them, and in three days you will be released. And he was released in those particular three days. Um, as the butler got out, some time passed by. He forgot about Joseph, but it came a time where the king had a dream. And the butler remember that Joseph interpreted his dream. But between that time and him getting out, um, the baker had remembered, had, was down in the prison. And the baker had a dream. And he had this dream and Joseph interpreted his dream. That he had baskets sitting on his head. 
basket with bread in it. And it had three of them. And so when the baker got out, um, uh, Joseph told him, well, in three days, you will be hung by your neck. And indeed, the baker died. Um, so why do I tell you all of this? I simply tell you this, is that God will send people yes, by your path, yes, and the people that he sends by your path is for your divine protection yes, and for your divine providence. Yes, and so within the life of Joseph, we see that these people that are in prison with him, the butler and the baker that are down in the prison, yes. they remember because had it not been for the butler, uh, Joseph would have stayed in the prison. But he's out of prison because the butler told the king that I know someone that can interpret your dream. Yeah. And J Joseph got out, interprets the king's dream, and the king elevated him to the second position in all of Egypt. Yeah. Egypt was a very powerful nation over the world at that particular time. There was no other nation at that time that was more powerful than Egypt. So in that particular time, that was the palace. But we see that Joseph life carried him through a pit, mm -hmm. carried him through a prison, yes. and then carried him and set him into a palace. So what am I saying to our youth today? Youth, I'm simply saying from where you are right now to your destiny and what God has for you, there's a lot of things that's going to happen to you. Ain't nothing easy. Don't nobody owe you one thing. Don't nobody owe you anything. Anything that you get in this world, you're going to have to earn it. I'm pretty sure that when William Joppy stepped into the ring, they didn't say, Mr. Joppy, we know you're going to win this fight today, so here's your belt. And you can take your belt and you don't have to fight today. I'm pretty sure that Mr. William Joppy had to show everybody that he was the welterweight champion of the world. So then, as we know, um, you got to work for it. God is going to give you, he's going to have the divine providence of your life. So what is providence? Before we go too far. Yes, sir. Providence. This word, pro, P R O, it means before. For dense, it comes from a, a, a Greek word for video. You see, that's where we get our word video from, it's from for dense. So when you take the video and you put it with pro, it simply means that God sees beforehand what's going to happen in your life. So that if I want to be successful in this world, in my life, it behooves me to go to God to get whatever he has for me in this life. You see, God already knows. He already knows my plan, the plan that he has devised for me. God already knows what you're going to be. God already knows. He's already determined. So what is the, the big question here? The big question, youth, is that you need to always keep your hand in God's hand. Keep your hand in God's hand because he's going to lead, guide, and direct you to your destiny and where you are. Now here's, here's something else that we need to extrapolate from this particular sermon is that Joseph did not forget where he came from. He didn't, he didn't forget where he came from because Joseph sent for his father and his brothers to come. And before Joseph could be placed into prominence where he what really needed to be, guess what he had to do? Forgive his brothers. Because see, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And, and, and that's why you say, you don't have to be discouraged by because people are talking about you. Let the people talk about you. They can call you all kinds of names. That does not mean you are that in which they are calling you that. Let me show you how this pit thing works. You see, the people who threw Joseph in the pit is the same people that God used to bring them out.
Jesus and Joseph's life is compared to that of Jesus. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph didn't do anything. Jesus didn't do anything. Joseph's own brothers did not like him and sold him into slavery. Jesus went to his own and his own received him not. Joseph was raised up out of the pit.
Lord is omnipresent. Yeah. Omni means all. Presence means to be somewhere. Yeah. Simply means that God is omnipresent. It's a non communicable attribute of the Lord. What that simply says is that God is everywhere at all times. And God sees you. He's working in and around your life. And God has been working with you all week. And God will, 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 will continue to talk on your heart to move you to the point of some decision. And I don't know where you are. If you're here, you're looking for a church home. You have not been fellowshipping with church home. You desire to make New Hope your church home. 